All right, well, I'm to have this as a resource for you, but I'm going to try to vary my presentation to integrate it with what we've been hearing today. Uh, so I'll still give the main thesis, but uh, I'm going to act like something actually happened today as opposed to ignoring it. Uh, so to begin with, the, the dean, uh, of course, mentioned the importance of trust. And in the current global crisis, we've seen how when trust is destroyed, entire markets shut down. Well, I'm a white collar criminologist and a former financial regulator. At law, the defining element of fraud that distinguishes it from other forms of theft is deceit. And what that means is I first create trust in you, the victim, and then I betray that trust. And that's why there's no more effective acid in eating away at societal trust than widespread fraud, in particular by elites. And I asked the dean, what does this motto mean? And it tells us to lift up our eyes. And that's exactly what my research tries to do. We lift up and we look at the people actually running the corporations, with the people who control them. And that's why we call it control fraud. For us, it's not a euphemism. For us, fraud is about as bad a word as you can use. Indeed, my problem all the time is getting my economics colleagues to be willing to say the F word. <laughs> right? This is the five letter F word that you can say in polite circles except in economics. So here's my thesis about these kinds of frauds and its interconnection with corruption. And that is that in the United States context, which is what I'll be talking about primarily, as we have gone through over the last 20 years, successive, increasingly worse financial crises, the role of formal corruption has reduced. And that's the bad news. Because you no longer have to bribe people. And that it isn't simply that the market response has failed to counter these problems. The market response has what we call in criminology created a criminogenic environment. That means an environment that creates widespread fraud, in particular accounting control fraud in the United States context, but certainly not limited to the United States. Iceland is the United States on steroids, right, in, in this kind of context. Before I go down this road, though, I wanted to mention something else that we tend to forget in these presentations. It isn't just that you end up with unpleasant shots. Fraud and corruption at these levels maim and kill people. They also destroy democracies through crony capitalism. But uh, well, I'm going to talk overwhelmingly about finance. Think of just a few things. Think of the Chinese infant formula scandal. It's cheaper to make infant formula out of water and chalk than out of milk. China looks for that kind of fraud through a test that looks for protein levels. So you add melamine because it spoofs the test. So now you have a product designed for the portion of our society that most desperately needs nutrition, that has zero nutritional value, and it contains a contaminant that causes kidney stones in infants. Killed at least six. The number of how many tens of thousands who were sickened is in dispute, but not the existence of it. And there is what we call in economics and criminology a Gresham's dynamic. A Gresham's dynamic is when people gain a competitive advantage from cheating and they drive honest competitors out of the marketplace. Everything becomes perverse. That is all too often the modern era. Corruption, if you want stories about corruption and death, again, I'm not picking on China, you can look to China, you can look to Turkey. They have very good seismic codes. 
Those seismic codes are not enforced. When those seismic codes are not enforced, schools pancake. And the saying in the seismic world is that earthquakes don't kill people, buildings kill people. Conversely, we tend to forget that regulation can work. There was a very strong earthquake in Long Beach, California in 1933 or 34. Had it occurred an hour and a half earlier, it would have killed thousands of school children. The reaction was the passage of the Nolan Act, which set up special seismic codes and a special body to ensure compliance with those codes. And since that time, quakes have not stopped in California, as you might imagine, but zero school children have died. So be of good cheer. Actually, things can be done that can make things very better, much better. Let me return to the story, though, and let me tell two discouraging stories. And uh, I'm going to ask you about them, because I'm going to suggest on one level it's clear why they're discouraging, but I'm going to suggest there's a second level that's far more discouraging and less obvious. So the first story is the United States in the current crisis. The FBI began warning in September 2004, a long time ago, that there was an epidemic of mortgage fraud and that it would produce a crisis. Now, nothing was done effective at any level, regulators, industry, or even the FBI to constrain that crisis. Fitch, the smallest of the three rating agencies, comes along in November 2007. That date is not random. The secondary market in subprime product died in March of 2007. And the rating agencies got over 40% of their total income from rating this toxic waste. It became their biggest business. And the, the top tier always got AAA ratings, which is supposed to mean virtually no credit risk. So Fitch is only willing to look at this point because the market has died and they're not going to lose any revenue. It looks at a small sample of subprime and what we call liar's loans. And that should have told you something right there, right? The, the, the trade calls them liar's loans. Probably it's not good. <laughs> and it says, and this is written by Brits, so you'll understand. The results were disconcerting <laughs> in that there was the appearance of fraud in nearly every file. Well, yes, that would be disconcerting. <coughs> and it said, remember, Fitch does this simply by looking at the loan files and the loan servicing files. No investigation. No private detectives. These are frauds obvious on the face of the underwriting documents, in other words. And there weren't many underwriting documents, so that's hard. And it said any normal underwriting would have spotted these frauds and prevented the loans from being made. Okay, that's the first story. Second story uh, was when uh, the World Bank hired me to work up new fraud indicators and to go to uh, India and field test them. And one of the indicators we have is, uh, this is in the context of procurement. And so when you want to bid on a World Bank contract, you have to provide a bank guarantee. And these, remember, these are bids, competitive bids. Now, these bank guarantees have numbers. 